Great. Well, thank you all so much uh, this morning. To We're here to learn about the history of New England stone walls. Stone walls are an iconic landscape feature of New England. They once served a functional purpose, but today they are threads through time defining the region's uh, historical identity. Join Lee Schoberth, Senior uh, Preservation Service Manager at Historic New England, to explore the history of stone wall building in the region and to develop a framework for identifying different types of stone walls. Prior to joining Historic New England, Lee worked as the Preservation Policy Associate for Preservation Society of Newport County and as a preservation professional for Knapp Ar Architects. Uh, she has a BA in History for the University of Michigan and an MS in Historic Preservation from Clemson University. Uh, so all 155 of us on the call, let's give a big virtual round of applause to Lee for joining us this morning. And Lee, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Great. Well, thank you. And thank you for that wonderful introduction. And thank you all of, uh, all of you joining us from around the, the area and outside the region. Um, it's wonderful to have such a, such a big crowd this morning. Um, so again, I'm Lee Schoberth from Historic New England, and today we're talking about New England stone walls. So for any of you who may not be familiar with Historic New England, it is the region's largest and most comprehensive preservation organization. As part of its mission, Historic New England saves and shares historic homes, open space, collections, and stories from the past and today. And through our work, we also hope to inspire good preservation practices beyond our sites and across the region. So within the organization, I'm part of the preservation services team, which builds partnerships between historic New England and preservation minded folks outside of our organization uh, with the shared goal of protecting historic properties throughout the region. We do this by um, mitigating change through our preservation easement program. These are privately owned homes that we hold a, a restriction on, sharing technical guidance through our um, homeowner services, strategically advocating for historic resources and providing educational opportunities like today's lecture. So on to our lecture. Um, it's easy to think a stone wall is a pile of rocks, albeit a carefully stacked pile of rocks, or that deciding to repair a stone wall can't be that complicated. So today we will delve into some of the considerations when tackling stone wall repairs and preservation, as well as the history of the stone walls. So today we'll look at, we'll start off with our historical trends in stone wall building. Um, then we'll look at some of the current legal protections and preservation efforts going on in the region. And finally, we'll kind of walk through some of the construction and things to consider if you do have a stone wall and are looking at to taking on kind of maintenance or repair work. All right, so part one is history of stone walls. So when the English colonists arrived in New England, they brought agricultural practices radically different from those of the indigenous people that permanently changed the landscape. Today we see this in the thousands of miles of stone walls threading through New England, bordering walls, defining fields, and wandering through the woods. There are many different types of stone walls, single walls, double walls, estate walls, freestanding and retaining, and you've probably heard more and more terms even besides those few. Um, so each is an enduring representation of where, when, and why they were constructed. We just see distinctive local variations of rounded versus flat stones, different colors, different heights, different thicknesses and widths. Um, and while some walls were finally built for public display or as fences for livestock, others were just mere containers to store excess stone. In 1939, mining engineer Oliver Bowles estimated there were approximately 240,000 miles of stone walls in New England. Um, he did this based on the 1872 Department of Agricultural Report on Fences uh, to estimate the distance. And to give you an idea how far this is, um, it is further than the distance to the moon or the length of the United States coastline. Um, so quite impressive when you consider those as our markers of, of length here. 
Um, but the question that often comes up is why are stone walls so prolific in New England? So we often hear it's because of the glacier that covered New England, um, but it's more than that because I'm originally from Michigan. And as you can see in the image here, the entire state of Michigan and most of the Midwest is covered by the same glacier that covered New England. Um, so you can see in the shaded, in the shaded area and the image here, kind of the extent of that glacier continent or that glacier coverage. So really, I mean, the glacier is a key part of this, but there are also two other factors that contribute to the stone wall presence. The second factor is the geological formations. This is the types of stones that we find in different parts of the country. As the glaciers formed, advanced, and eventually retreated, their immense weight ripped up the bedrock and soil that was incorporated and that was incorporated into the glaciers and eventually deposited as till. So the till deposits can range from tiny particles of soil to enormous boulders. In the Midwest, where I'm originally from, the bedrock was typically a softer stone like limestone or sandstone, and so it was easily crushed into tiny particles. In contrast, in New England, we generally find hard, irregular bedrock like granite that's strong enough to resist the crushing weight of the glaciers. So this resulted in much larger stones up to the size of boulders or even bigger, some of the formations that are in this area um, in the till deposit. And so you see here, um, here I've got highlighted those kind of those till layers of the soil that we're talking about. And we'll come back to this diagram again in a few slides. So the third factor is the deforestation that occurred in New England. It really takes all three of these factors for stone walls to be present. So let's look back at those diagrams. Um, so in the soil layers before deforestation are on the left. Um, and the deforestation that led to the stones in the fields is on the right. Um, so first you'll notice when you're looking at the two sides of this diagram, the thickness of the topsoil. So the trees helped the land retain water and the topsoil. Without the forest, the soil erodes and washes away. And this erosion of the topsoil exposed New England's deeper subsoil to the cold, causing a deeper freeze of groundwater and accelerating frost heave. And so you, you can see kind of this nice thick layer here. It was almost kind of a blanket over the subsoil and the till layers down to the bedrock. Um, but that's almost nothing in the, the side diagram here. So each winter and spring, um, the, the deeper freeze during the winter caused frost heave, which um, increased the presence of ice in these deeper layers. So as the, the ice got deeper into the groundwater froze, um, the ice pushed the stones from the till layer that were here up to the top. So you can see them changing here in the diagram. So this freeze thaw cycle repeated each spring, bringing new stone yields to the surface. Um, stone walls were not necessarily colonial phenomena, although they existed at the time. It's really generations after the deforestation occurred that, um, that they were met with these fields of stone each spring. So the height of stone wall construction begins in the mid to late 1700s. Um, after the Revolutionary War, the colonists were confronted with timber shortages and fields filled with increasing amounts of exposed stone. After decades of clearing New England's dense forests for farmland, the once infinite supply of wood could not meet the demands of rebuilding homes and damaged fences following the war. Wood became a commodity too precious for fencing. And although more time consuming to construct, the abundance of stone provided a durable material alternative to wood. So Historic New England has 38 museum sites with staff offices scattered throughout the region. Um, but my office is based at Lyman Estate in Welfam, Mass. And this last fall, I had I connected with Mort Isaacson, I'm sorry, Mort Isaacson from the Historical Society about some of the research he completed documenting stone walls in Welfam. 
So you'll remember at the beginning of my lecture, I mentioned that the most prolific building period was following the Revolutionary War. Um, but this does not mean that there aren't earlier walls or stone being used as boundary markers earlier than this, you know, kind of mid 1700s. Um, so this line of stones is actually ties to the settlement of Welfam and the great dividend grants in the city or the town. Um, and so this is a really seemingly kind of simple, you know, um, wall, but it has a really important connection with the history of the, the area. So this is a 1738 map showing the original grants from the 1734, um, from 1634 and 1640. Um, so here's a quick look at Welfam today. You'll see that it's generally the same shape, um, a few tweaks to the border, um, but the Great Divide consists dividend grants consisted of 120 lots divvied up among the 120 freemen of Watertown. These freemen were not um, not only white male residents, but most of them were and generally wealthier. Um, but they were the founders and had been accepted into um, they were found founders of the town. Um, and so these lots were laid out into four groups of 30 lots, which is called squadrons. And each group of lots being um, mostly a strip about one and a half miles wide and about a half and five miles long. So, sorry, half a mile wide and five miles long. So most lots were rectangular. Um, and so you'll see here with these lines, this is the four squadron lines, and then the lines coming off of them are dividing into those lots. And so our line, our line of stones are kind of unassuming, um, probably wouldn't have noticed them otherwise, is actually lines up exactly with one of the squadron lines from the 17th century dividend of Welfam. And so it's really kind of connected to the founding of the history of that town. Um, stone walls are also the works of innumerable laborers whose existence may not otherwise be recorded. Um, depending on when and where stone walls were built, they could have been constructed by farmers, enslaved, indentured, freed, indigenous, and Black people. Um, First-hand accounts of stone wall building from this period are generally limited, but archival records can sometimes provide a lens into history. So among the Casey family papers are entries by Silas Casey. Um, he's, up, he's the one on top and his descendant Thomas Lincoln Casey Sr. who's below. Um, the, and their records detail the stone wall building efforts at historic New England's Casey Farm in Saunderstown, Rhode Island. Um, so entries date from 1777 to 1881, and this aligns with the most prolific era of stone wall building in the region. Entries found in the Casey family papers include descriptions of lengths like 40.75 rods and also types, double walls, and there are also a few notes of who built them. Uh, we know that Caesar Northrup was a hired African-American farmhand who worked on the stone walls at Casey Farm, and that Reinhard Knowles was a tenant farmer that also worked there. And so as fields were being prepared for planting in the spring and those new stones that we were talking about from the freeze-thaw cycle, um, pushed to the surface by were moved to the outer areas or the outer edges of the field with using stone boats pulled by oxen. Um, so walls at the field's edge were typically in this early period, just tossed piles of stone. They were moved there quickly to kind of get out of the way. Um, sometimes they were stacked a little more carefully into the single walls, um, but we find that most often kind of walls closer to the home were the more carefully constructed double walls and uh, the little bit more finer finish. And so this aerial image illustrates the typical field division of early New England farms. So they were small fields, only a few acres and bounded by stone walls. Um, so you'll note the dashed lines on this 1876 US survey, looking at a portion of Middletown, Rhode Island, 
Um, these dashed lines are likely documenting the location of stone walls bordering individual fields. So again, we're looking at those kind of a couple of acres, very small fields. Um, New England farmers had divided and fenced their land under the assumption that small fields produced better. Um, but these small fields were also what most families could manage because at this time we're doing subsistence farming. We're not doing large scale commercial farming. This is just subsistence farming in this early period. Stone walls were also used around cemeteries and pasture land as well as fields. Um, town pounds were also constructed of stone um, where stray animals were confined. They were usually dry laid construction, roughly square in plan. Um, and the kind of key distinction here is this lintel over the gate above. Um, so these very simple structures met some very practical requirements to these formative agricultural communities. So earlier we talked about glacial deposits could range from small, small particles to border, boulders. Um, and some stones were small enough that one or two people could lift them. Larger ones required the use of crowbars and stone boats, also known as a skid shown here in the image. Once the stone was on the skid, it could be pulled by an oxen out of the middle of the field and over to the edges of the field. So we were talking about that kind of clearing of the field earlier and moving it to the outward edges. And so this is really how a lot of those stones were kind of moved um, and stacked outside along our border of our couple acre um, fields here. There were also techniques um, if a stone was too large to be able to move it onto the skid or by oxen, um, depending on when it was, the stone may have just been left in place if it was too large. Um, sometimes they would dig a hole to bury it so that it was out of the out of the way of their work. Um, or they drilled holes into the stone, allowing the ice and the water to kind of enter into the stone, hoping that that freeze thaw cycle would break it apart. Um, and at points they used black powder and later dynamite to also to break apart some of these large stones that were too big to handle. But stone walls in part also contributed to the decline of farming in New England. Uh, by the 1850s, they were about 168,000 small family farms in New England and New York. Um, about 75 to 80% of the region had been cleared and farmed at this time. So the region's small fields that were adequate for the subsistence farming for generations um, became were not uh, usable as we started to shift towards a commercial agricultural market. The small walled fields could not accommodate advancements and new horse powered machinery necessary to compete with the Western states large scale farming. And also the growing demand for food in urban areas. So by the end of the 19th century, most of New England's family farms were abandoned either for fertile ground to the West or the lure of steady jobs in the factories. So the followed fields were left behind, eventually returning to forest, but the stone walls still remained. Um, so the image here from the Harvard Forest Archive shows the Swift River Valley in Massachusetts um, in the 1890s on the left. And the image on the right is about 100 years later after the forests returned. Um, but the stone wall building tradition does continue into the 19th century, but not as agricultural delineators, but as statements of influence. So as state walls served an aesthetic function, enhancing a home's beauty, but in contrast to the agricultural walls, um, they were not built from found materials and they were often constructed of quarried stone transported to the site. So this change in material really kind of severs that historical relationship between wall building and the farming and the land where the resources came from. So the Industrial Revolution also increased demands for stonemasons to construct railroads, bridges, factories, and country estates like historic New England's Eustis Estate in Milton, Massachusetts, until the establishment of large residential estates in the 19th century, Milton was primarily an agricultural community, but its proximity and traditional agricultural 
agricultural character drew wealthy residents with 19th century notions that rural living could counter industrialized and urban stresses. So in 1878, uh, Eustis Estate became the permanent residence of William Ellery Channing and Edith Hemingway Eustis. So the Eustis House, the outbuildings and the boundary walls along Canton Avenue illustrate 19th century stone masonry and rural living. These buildings and walls constructed of local stone display both quarried stone and field stone construction. Um, during his residence, Eustis maintained a small farm with livestock, cultivated fields, hay fields, and an ice pond. Um, so he really helped to kind of continue that historical agricultural use of the site. And as the New England landscape continued to be reshaped by generations, agricultural stone walls still endured. And when Walter and Issa Gropius selected the site to build their house in Lincoln, Massachusetts in 1938, they maintained vestiges of its agricultural past. Um, so it's a hilltop site, it's delineated by stone walls, and it also has an apple orchard, all of which still exists today. The integration of modern arch architectural design blended with vernacular form and materials informed the design of the house. Um, but Gropius also kind of brought this to the landscape and the landscape features. So while um, architect Walt used retaining walls um, derived from the existing agricultural stone walls at the site. Um, and so you see here kind of immediately around the house, we have these almost kind of a blend between our estate walls and our kind of traditional agricultural walls where he's creating a permeable boundary kind of as a nod to those historical stone walls that are that were still in existence. So I'll flip back to our photo before. So here in the front, this is uh, along the road at Gropius House, and this is a, a historical agricultural wall. And then these are the walls that are kind of immediately around the house that Gropius intentionally designed. And so he was really trying to create this seamless um, transition between the kind of domestic space and use around the house, to the agricultural past of the site. Um, and this is Dole Little House. This is in Newberry. Um, I don't have an exact photo of or exact date for this photo, but we know this is pre-restoration work that happened in the 1940s. And I, I add this in here because I want to come back to this you know, idea of the fences being replaced by stone walls. Um, and so we have this image of a dull little house uh, with the wood fence out front here. And then this is a photo of dull little today. And actually during this, the 1940s when this restoration and this kind of um, in the spirit of the colonial revival was going on, there was decisions that were made that they brought that they brought a stone wall to the site and actually replaced that the fence that was historically there. But this kind of speaking back to this earlier period of stone walls. And so it's it's even past kind of Walter Gropius, where we're still seeing this these stone walls enduring. Um, and so although they once served a functional purpose. Uh, today, they are threads through the landscape, really kind of defining the region's historical identity. Um, stone walls are imbued with the diverse history of the region's inhabitants. They are also memorials to the agricultural past and those who came before. Um, and they have endured centuries of harsh New England winters. They've withstood regional development pressures and weathered abandonment. Um, but their familiarity makes them both cherished and often overlooked their permanence taken for granted, which leads us to our second part of tonight's lecture. Um, so we're gonna take a quick look at some protections and preservation efforts that are going on in the region. So first let's talk about threats to stone walls, um, despite their significance and importance to the region. So uh, their stone walls are constantly under threat from both natural and human forces. Roots from vegetation and trees can push stone walls apart. Their proximity to driveways and roads makes them subject to vehicle um, and damage. Their seemingly public access leaves them open to theft and their locations inconvenient for development. 
And so there is state level legislation in at, three, at least three of New England states. Um, stone walls are protected in Ma Massachusetts under the Mass General Law. Um, as with many laws protecting stone walls, these are actually very limited um, and the fines too small to actually discourage theft and removal and destruction. And so you'll note here that there's, it says a fine of not more than $10. Um, and this, so this is not really very discouraging if um, in the big scheme of a development project, um, if a stone wall is in the way. Uh, in Rhode Island, there's the Leona Kelly Act, which requires that convicted defendants pay restitution at the discretion of judges. And so no specific amount um, is, is listed here, um, but it protects 17th through 20th centuries uh, stone walls that were as boundaries and also new stone walls that closely resemble historical stone walls. So even if a wall was rebuilt in the 21st century, um, but is really kind of harkening back to that dry late agricultural wall, those also fall into the protection of the Leota Kelly Act. And then in New Hampshire, stone walls are protected if they are part of a designated state scenic road. Um, and there may be additional protections for stone walls in these states as well as uh, other states at local levels. Um, but these are just kind of the statewide protections that are listed. So aside from legislation, as we saw kind of legislation um, protections for stone walls is very limited. So it really, there, it depends a lot on kind of private homeowners, local groups, conservation organizations, kind of advocacy and documentation efforts to really to preserve stone walls and to kind of um, record the history that they represent. And there are also training opportunities throughout the region that help preserve stone walls and traditional building crafts. Um, there's a number of volunteer opportunities that I've come across in my research. Um, and I just listed a few efforts that I came across um, here on the slide, but I encourage you to kind of check out if you're interested to find out a little bit more about protections and opportunities to help you know, advocate for stone walls to look at and find out what's going on in your local community. Um, and there's also other stewards include kind of historic sites like historic New England, you saw Casey Farm, Eustace Estate, Gropius House, um, Dole Little. These are just, you know, a handful of our sites that have stone walls or stone walls associated with them. Um, and so we, we are constantly working to preserve the stone walls at our sites as well. And then I'll also point out that there are um, training and advocacy organizations like the Dry Stone Conservancy out of Kentucky and the Stone Trust out of Vermont. Um, both of these offer public workshops and certifications. Um, and there's also some interesting documentation efforts going on in New Hampshire with the Stone Wall Mapper. So there's lots of, lots of interest and lots of things going on with stone walls. And so this is just, just a quick um, overview of some of those. Um, and then we'll, we'll get into a little bit more about the stone wall construction now. Um, so before joining Historic New England, um, as Robert mentioned, I worked for the Preservation Society of Newport County, and I was part of the team that launched the Equidnik Stone Wall Initiative. This was a collaborative effort between the Preservation Society and Pre Preserve Rhode Island, the statewide um, preservation nonprofit. And the team had, a, we had a decent understanding of stone walls before we got started, um, but not really a clue about construction. So we knew kind of the history, knew the agricultural, I mean, we knew that, but we didn't really understand kind of how we magically dry lay some stones and create these beautiful walls that um, are such a classic New England image. So several of us attended one of the public workshops that's offered by the Stone Trust in Vermont. And through this hands-on workshop, we learned about the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain and the five principles of stone wall building um, and the parts of stone walls and actually built a section of a double wall. So in this next section, I'm gonna take us kind of a quick overview of the five principles in wall construction. Um, so if you're starting to think about your own walls or um, are just kind of curious of how, how these are constructed. Um, so most walls you'll come across are going to fit into one of three categories. Um, stone piles, as I mentioned, 
there are still stone walls that are just, you know, kind of a little more tossed looking. Um, and then single stacks. So these are a carefully laid kind of one layer of stones just stacked on top of each other. And then double walls. Uh, we're going to take a little bit closer look at double walls since they are the most complicated type of walls. Um, this is the, the most formal type of wall. Um, and so this is where we're talking about sometimes we see these a little bit more closer to the home. Um, and I've also have found that there seems to be more double wall examples in Rhode Island than in Massachusetts. And I think some of this is the type of stone that we're seeing in Rhode Island is a little more flat um, and kind of bread loaf, where in Massachusetts, it seems to be that I'm more walls or more stone seems to be kind of more of this boulder type. And so you'll get different, these kind of different types of walls. Um, the, the popularity or the number of them showing up kind of changing from each state and different characters. And even from town to town, you get different characteristics of these stone walls. But we'll take a look at the double walls here. Um, so the best models that are still standing relied on carefully fitting each stone and gravity to keep them standing. Um, there was no mortar used in these historical agricultural walls. Um, and now the principles outlined on this slide, these are from the Dry Stone Walling Association of Great Britain. But our early wall builders would have either brought the building tradition with them from perhaps Great Britain, or they would have learned just from trial and error. The beginning of the 1800s, there were some agricultural publications that did provide limited but often contradictory advice. Um, so the only consistent recommendation was to take your time to build them and to stack stone one over two, let's see here, or two over one. And so what this does is it creates the zigzag joint down the face of the wall. And what we're trying to avoid is this vertical running joints where it creates a weak point in the wall. And as you're, you're probably thinking about this and you'll go out and look at stone walls later today and you'll see tons of vertical lines of walls that are still standing. Um, but this is a little bit more consistently, we know that uh, a longevity of the zigzag and the one over two, two over one um, is, a, is a better guarantee to getting your stone wall to last longer. Not that there aren't standing examples with vertical joints. So the second principle is to set the length of the stone into the wall. Um, and again, so we're talking about these Great Britain, um, their standards that they're you know, using today and recommending today, but you will see plenty of historical examples that were just facing, you know, lengthwise, um, as you'll see in the bottom part of the image here, you'll see plenty of these examples also, but this is just kind of that if you're, you're doing work today and helping ensure that your wall lasts as long as some of these um, 100 and 200 year old walls. And so you see the length in here versus the kind of long side, really kind of running along the face of the wall. Um, and we'll take a closer look at Harding in a few slides um, when we actually talk about the construction. But the third principle is to heart the wall tightly. And so this is that very inner part of a wall that's not actually seen. And then just like masonry, you want to keep your courses even and level. And then finally, we want to build the wall um, in the plane. So you want to make those nice straight lines and, and not, you know, kind of curving along or kind of leaning to one side, although plenty, again, plenty of historical examples that do all of these things that we recommend against. Uh, but this kind of best practices today to make sure that your wall lasts. So parts of the wall and construction, um, the footings, are the bottom most layer. These consist of the largest stones. These stones are sometimes are buried or partially buried to provide a stable base for the wall to rise from. And if you look at those, um, look at our five principles here in the field. Um, so we're keeping the stones level by using mason lines, which I've highlighted in red here since they're pretty light in the photo. Um, but these are helping our, our stone mason that we were working with to kind of keep those courses level as we're as one of those principles. 
And then um, the, the next part of the wall is the face stones. So this is where the name of the double wall comes from because you actually have two sides of the face stones. We're in a single wall. We're just seeing we're seeing both sides of that um, of that single stone going up. And so the faces of the wall are built by adding kind of courses of face stones, just like masonry. Um, so this is the same wall as the previous slide after a few more courses have been added. So starting at the bottom with the largest stones, we're moving up the wall to smaller stones. Um, and they're also stacked at a slight angle. And this is known as a batter. And so in the image here, you can see the batter frame. And so this is another guy that's helping our mason, um, you know, to construct these walls so that they're nice and straight. We've got even courses and we've got that little bit of an angle to the wall. And since we are working with irregular shaped material, there are a couple extra steps to ensure that the wall um, is strong when placing face stones. So despite working with irregular stones, we do want to strive for three points of contact. Um, and then smaller stones are used to kind of pin or stabilize, because even if you've got those points, you might still have a stone that's rocking. And so there's these small stones that you can see here in the image where they're kind of tucked in and helping create an extra point of contact. And then once the face stones are pinned, the remaining gaps are filled with the smallest stones. And this is called the harding. So kind of in here, in the middle here, we've got these kind of pinning and harding stones that aren't gonna be visible once the wall or from the outside of the wall and once the capstone is put on. And so if you remember, our third principle was to heart the wall tightly. And then in taller walls, at about three feet high, um, the through stones are placed every few feet along the length of the wall. This helps connect the two faces of the wall and prevent it from kind of bellying out. The other thing that's really interesting sometimes with through stones is they actually use these long stones to create kind of a steps up the side of the wall. Um, so it could be you know, going from one field to another, kind of creating a stair for themselves to get over, um, which are really kind of interesting to see if you find those kind of steps built into a wall example. And then similar to our through stones, kind of our finished stone is our capstone. Um, but this is going to, like the through stone is going to connect those two faces of the wall and it help prevent that bellying out at the top. And so these are usually large, relatively flat stones um, that are placed closely together and give you that kind of finished edge on the top of the double wall. And then sometimes you'll find examples that also use a cope stone. So these are vertically placed on top of the capstone and they create this kind of uneven jagged top that you see here. Um, and so there's, there's some different theories about why this was used. Um, and I've heard that the uneven surface can discourage goats and other livestock from jumping over. And the other thing that is kind of more of a practical construction side is that if you're trying to get that extra height on the wall, this is an easy way to get a few extra you know, inches or so without having to stack so many more and, you know, additional stones. And so you can just put this up and you got an extra foot or so. Um, taller wall with these cope stones. So it could be kind of a functional as a discouraging an animal or just trying to get that extra height without the extra labor that would that would be necessary to get the, the wall this high. And then if you've got stone walls or you know in your community and thinking about maintenance and repairs, uh, we'll talk about that next. So sometimes uh, repairs are required for stone walls. And it's really important to kind of think about um, if, if not all walls need to be repaired, some walls need to, and we're gonna kind of go through some of the different, um, different things to consider when, when a big kind of repair project comes up. And so first there are kind of three general types of, of stone walls, and we're not talking about kind of our stone piles and single walls are kind of talking about now that they've been around for you know 100, 200 years that um, they've they've been exposed to the elements and and have kind of these different influences that you know when we're talking about those walls after the abandonment of farms in kind of the mid 19th century 
where the forest grew up. And now we have these stone walls that still run through the forest. So that have been left, you know, kind of to their own weathering and, and exposure to the elements. So these are called wild walls. And these have kind of maybe been tumbled down, there's vegetation growth, um, but we really kind of want to leave these alone usually unless there is, um, is a safety concern or something that, you know, a driving reason why it's important to kind of repair and get these walls back into shape. But generally we want to leave these because they are now serving as habitat for wildlife. Um, and so just kind of leave them in their untouched states and allow them to, you know, kind of continue to age as nature sees fit. And um, we also have our historical walls. These are the ones associated maybe with cultural locations such as churchyards or roads, um, building foundations. These could be kind of the walls that are around the, the center of a historic farm. And so these are the ones that maybe are still in good condition. They're still visible or part of your, you know, along the road of your house. And so these are the ones where we kind of want to think about, you know, preservation and repair and maintenance of these is kind of, you know, upkeep as part of your landscape. Um, and so we may be thinking about repair work for this type of wall. And also with the state walls. So they were, remember, they were primarily constructed for decorative or ornamental purposes. And so to keep them up in good condition is really kind of continuing that, that history and the importance of, or, and the reason that they were constructed. And so with these later two, we really kind of can talk about restoration and repair work. Well, my bat recommendation for wild walls, unless there is really kind of a driving factor to leave them be. And so we know the earliest stone walls were probably a combination of stone and wood, but in time, the wood fence deteriorated, leaving behind stone piles. Um, and so most field boundary walls likely started as stone piles or a single stack. Um, and single stack walls are actually the most common wall types, especially you know, in Massachusetts, that's usually the examples that I'm seeing. Um, while double walls are usually kind of found on prosperous middle-class family farms, they're a little bit more on the formal side. Um, and so keeping in mind that these kind of different, different types of walls um, and, and how you'll approach those. So if you have a stone pile, you may just kind of want to maintenance and repair, may just kind of be keeping that pile contained where it is, while single stack and double walls, you want to kind of keep them up, up, you know, with the wall, the stones in place and not tumbling down and just kind of keeping them maintained. And so really it's important to think about the type of wall construction, you know, that you've got and making sure that if you're doing repairs that you're keeping that um, visual function of them. The other thing we want to think about is the type of local stone, how that affects the character of your wall. So just like the different types of wall, we want to think about what the wall is made of. Um, and so if you take a close look at some of the examples here, you know, we've got here at Gropius House, these are kind of a little bit more of a bread loaf shape of stone. So if we're doing repairs and need to bring in more stone, we want to make sure that we're matching these characteristics of the kind of shape, the size, the color, the kind of overall feel, like this is a single stack wall, that we want to make sure that we're kind of keeping those characteristics. Well, here, this is an example from Rhode Island. This is one of those formal double walls. And you'll see kind of compared to the, the fat bread loaf, um, our food references here of stones, here we've got more of a pancake. Um, and that's because the difference of the types of stones that are found in Massachusetts versus Rhode Island. At this site, we were having a lot of slate stones that were found. Um, and so this really kind of thin courses and thin stones is characteristic of the walls here in Middletown where this one is located. While we were seeing a different type of stone at uh, Gropius House. So finally, the question that you may be faced with after you've made decisions about what type of wall you have, um, wild historical um, double wall or kind of estate wall or the type of wall as far as a, the stone pile, the single stack, the double wall, you may be faced, and after you've made decisions about your, your 
stone sources and materials that you're using, the dry laid versus mortared. Um, so traditionally, agricultural walls were dry laid. We see the introduction of mortar in the formal estate walls of the late 19th century. Um, so if we're working with traditionally laid wall, you may be faced with the question, do we add mortar? Do we add mortar here, kind of where the capstones are? A lot of times sites face theft if they're kind of more of a public because people will steal these large capstones because they're nice and flat um, to be able to use like a path in their garden or to you know, construct a pond or to use as some sort of kind of landscape feature aside from the stone wall. And the expense and availability of these, um, we often hear about them being stolen and so walls being stolen. So you may be half facing, do we wanna mortar these capstones to make sure to prevent theft? And so you may be making that decision. Um, but we also hear kind of stone walls that are being kind of filled with mortar on the, in the interior as a way of, with the thinking that this is going to make them stronger and last longer. Um, and while done with good intentions, we often see this fail um, because the thing that's so wonderful about the dry laid stone walls is that any water, any soil, things just are washed out through the walls um, where mortar actually can help kind of trap some of that moisture in. And so that freeze thaw cycle starts to really wreak havoc on mortared walls. And so with, you know, with this idea that the mortar is going to reduce maintenance and make this wall stronger, um, it actually sometimes can be the downfall of walls. So I recommend kind of really thinking through if you're looking at adding mortar to a traditional wall, why you're doing it and what the possible, you know, benefits or um, cons, pros or cons of doing this and why you're doing it. And so I would come back to that photo that at the beginning of this section where it was showing that um, this was an extensive stone wall repair. And so we were walking through when I was working on this project, all of these questions that I just brought up and, and making those decisions. And so that's why, I, and we were, you know, trying to decide what is best practices, what's the best approach for this wall. Um, and so you see here, I'm sorry, my photo, this is my, after photo is was taken in January. So it was kind of a, a gray and drizzly, but you can really see kind of the difference that the stone wall of was collapsed. And this stone wall had faced everything from, from all the possible threats from cars to roots. Um, there were trenches dug underneath it for electrical work that had, um, had kind of messed with the foundation layers and loud, um, which led to this wall to collapse. And so when we came in and we did those repairs and we were really thinking about the style of wall, the type of wall, the types of materials um, when we went through this. And so it can be really powerful, those kind of before and after photos of a major stone wall repair. And so just kind of recapping what we've been talking about here, if you're making decisions about repair or maintenance, um, that wall type, also the wall construction, the type of stone, the height, the width, and the batter, because you know the, the wonderful thing about dry laid stone walls is that you can actually do gap repairs. You don't have to take on the entire wall. You can do small sections. And so you wanna make sure that all of these things are kind of these characteristics are matching so that you have that kind of seamless blend of your repair work to maybe the historical wall, the sections that have been you know, well-constructed, have not had any issues and are still standing. Um, but stone wall care doesn't just mean restoration. It can also be simple, regular maintenance to help upkeep and prevent larger repairs. And so the, the easy thing to do is kind of to set yourself up with an annual inspection and monitoring. Um, it's really kind of great to do this in the spring and also in the fall as we're kind of in those transition seasoning seasons and looking to see what kind of vegetation we've got. Um, is it clear, is the wall clear of vines, ivy? Um, are there leaves that are kind of building up along the base of the wall and just kind of really keeping that, that clear to prevent that kind of trapping moisture in the wall or roots um, that could possibly break the wall apart? 
Also looking to see if a stone has been knocked out of place and if it's one that you're able to pick up and put back into place be, to do that, just to make sure that we aren't slowly kind of eroding the stone walls, losing you know one stone at a time um, and just making sure that we're kind of putting those back as we notice them. And then regular mowing and kind of removing uh, leaf and debris can kind of you know keep that wall clear, keep the water and ice out of the wall, especially right before winter. And you know, as we that uh, freeze thaw cycle can be very damaging. So as an individual, you can also maybe you don't have stone walls on your site or your property that you're that um, that you're doing these regular maintenance, but there are also different ways to support stone walls, whether it's supporting an organization and its preservation efforts or looking for volunteer opportunities kind of throughout the country or throughout the region. Um, there's a number of them out there and just becoming involved in preservation of stone walls that way. Um, and then in preservation, we often say there is no one size fits all solution. And it's very true with stone walls. And that's, you know, I started the this presentation thinking about, you know, stone walls start off seemingly simple, but as you get kind of into the walls and different characteristics, um, they can become very complicated. And so it's really, and, and also your needs and what is this, how the site is being used and really kind of thinking about those decisions um, as you're taking on work with stone walls. And so it's, I recommend kind of spending some time observing, documenting those characteristics, understanding the construction method because this really reflects kind of its place and region in the region and the history of the stone wall. And I hope you all found that this guide helpful in considering your stone wall preservation. And so then I will, um, that concludes my lecture, but I think we can open it up to questions. All right, wonderful job, Lee, as expected. So folks, we'll take uh, 10 minutes of questions. Uh, if you have a question, uh, please um, uh, type it into the Q&A box. Uh, I know we also had some questions coming through the chat uh, I'll try to catch everything. Okay, uh, first question goes to Frank, who says, I have noticed stone walls in Rhode Island are from more flat rocks. I assume that is from local geology? Yes, um, and so that's in, in Rhode Island, we're tending to deal with more slate stones. And so they tend to be, you know, thinner, kind of long, thinner pieces. We're in, or in Massachusetts, we've got more granite and some conglomerate stones, and so you get those different shapes. But you're absolutely right. It's, it's definitely the types of stone that are in the region. And, and so you can see also, if you go to kind of Connecticut or even in New Hampshire, you see some of these different types of stone. Um, and it comes back to that bedrock in the geology. That, oh, uh, Linda asks, do you believe that any of the stone structures or walls were from Native Americans? So there is a history and we know that there are um, traditions of stone wall building and different stone um, structures that the Native American and indigenous people did. Uh, the walls where they're kind of that defining the fields or along boundary walls is not, um, at least before the colonists were there, was not the way that Native Americans used the land. Um, and so there are there are stone formations out there that are tied to the Native American indigenous history, but most of these walls where they're a straight line or they're kind of outlining a field, um, we're pretty sure that those are dating to the colonial. Um, but there are you know kind of there are walls um, out there and different types of forms of structures that do that do relate to the indigenous and Native American history, but they're usually is a little bit different in kind of use and purpose of them. Karen asks, how can you tell which century a stone wall was built in? Oh, that is really challenging. Um, the, the, the struggle with being able to date the stone walls, so we know based on kind of history, when those and trends of when the most prolific stone wall building happened. Um, but what's difficult is that often kind of a stone wall was rebuilt or added to kind of over the centuries and there isn't necessarily a good way to date them. Um, there is 
some suggestion that um, if you had somebody who understood and it's a little outside of my understanding is kind of the mold and mildew that's on the wall. They use it a lot of times with gravestones where they can kind of help, you know, the growth or the growth rate. Um, but it can be really kind of inconsistent depending on, you know, whether it was a, a stone that was reused when a wall was constructed or if it was reused somewhere else. Sometimes that can help, that can do the results. Uh, but there isn't kind of a telltale sign of when a wall was constructed unless you've got something like images or a documentation or kind of the, the notes that we found from Casey Farm. Um, it can be challenging to kind of to date a stone wall. Um, but there, there are some different theories of how to do it. Uh, but really, I think the best way is to kind of know from documentation whether a wall existed or not at that site at a time. Um, but it can be, there's not a, like a, a good way to date them necessarily looking at one. Uh, an anonymous attendee asks, how does, how does one go about mapping the stone walls in their own town and who can offer help or support? So a lot of times, um, so I know in New Hampshire has a really interesting um, kind of a open source where they're doing it with LIDAR, which is, um, I forget what the acronym is. It's kind of this light. It's um, they've got scans of the landscape where um, with GIS. I'm throwing out all these terms, and I'm like, um, but what's really interesting is it's it's all kind of sitting on their computer, and you can look at the way the different topography and formations where they can start to identify what possibly is a stone wall because they're so straight and regular. And so they've started to do using GIS and the LIDAR maps to be able to kind of mark where those are. And then whether it's one that is just believed from that and then one that's confirmed in a site. Um, and so, but you can also just, you know, using that kind of photography or kind of Google maps and making just those notes where stone walls exist is a little bit more uh, approachable version of that. And usually we find kind of local historical societies or your um, historic commission are usually the ones that might be taking on that work and kind of trying to document stone wall surveys. And um, they're usually, or yeah, kind of um, where they're able to kind of to hold those records and be kind of a, a place that is that is gathering that information. Uh, we have several questions about stone walls in Europe, um, uh, Ireland, England, and um, so what are the connections between stone, stone walls in New England versus stone walls in Europe? What are, can you compare and contrast those? Yeah, so what's really interesting is if we go way back in time to you know, Pangaea, the supercontinent, New England and England were actually right next to each other. And so we have a lot of the same geological kind of formations um, that led to that, that same type of bedrock. Um, and then we're really, we have a lot of like the kind of Great Britain and, and the English and the Irish coming over as colonists into, into New England. And so they were bringing those traditions with them. And so there's that direct connection kind of at the geological level of, you know, we're having those same type of of stones that they were finding in England when they came over here, they were facing kind of some of those similar things. The only difference is that um, England and, and Ireland and that they kind of went through that stone wall building and the, the agricultural period much earlier than us. And so they were bringing that same kind of traditions with them when they came here and kind of faced the same deforestation, stones happened and that stone wall. So there is that direct connection between um, between the two walls or the, the, the two countries. We're the gonna country. take a couple more questions. I literally have 20 questions that I haven't asked. We're gonna to get to maybe two or three of them here. Uh, I do wanna wrap up shortly. So let's take a, at least two more here. Uh, Steven says, uh, he asks, were any of the stone walls constructed for military uses during the Revolutionary War or the Civil War? That is a great question. Not that I, I have not seen that come up in the resources that I have, have looked at. I think the thing that would be challenging with those is the time it takes to build the stone walls, uh, but they definitely could be some of those piles or um, 
the stones kind of getting them out of the way a little less formal walls as possible but i've not come across any kind of research or references that connect it with military history but i think it's a great avenue to explore further uh, donna asks can you elaberate about the use of berm stone walls berm stone walls this I'm not sure that I know. Is it as far as kind of like a retaining wall where they're um, where the and, the so Donna, if in the chat, if you want to elaborate, yeah. um, uh, do so. Maybe, maybe we've maybe we've stumped Lee, um, or maybe yeah, the question just wasn't clear. But uh, uh, Donna, we're only going to be on the call for maybe two more minutes. But if you're fast, Donna, let us know in the chat what you're referring to. Uh, let's see here. Sandy asks, why are some stacked walls uh, punctuated with larger stones, often a different color? Do you so see that, Lee? I have seen that. And I think some, it could come back to that. Um, sometimes with, with the rebuilding, we see a little bit more kind of consciously the aesthetic of the walls. Um, or it could be kind of an anomaly of a stone that's, that's in the area that, you know, with these larger ones, that it was unable to move it, and so they built the wall around it. But it could be kind of as they're thinking about that, the, um, as we get kind of those, they start off as very functional and just as a way to get out the stones out of the field, and then we get the little bit more formal um, as we kind of go through the history of stone walls. And so this could be kind of an aesthetic decision to kind of create a different, um, a different look. We also see in, in Newport and Middletown and kind of the Quinnick Island when I was working on that project, that sometimes they would put these big stones that were tall verticals as a way to kind of mark the ends of gates. Um, and so there could be also a functional use to these um, where they were kind of, they were using that to, to mark the openings. Um, and so there, there could be a number of different reasons of why um, it's hard with without looking at an image, but that that's my my best guess is kind of why why that um, could be. Uh, Polly asks, is there a name for the modern walls we're seeing now where the stones all have a very flat face? Are these manufactured or processed stones to be able to get that look? So these stones are probably quarried um, and and they can, or they can be a veneer with some of these walls where they're just kind of creating that illusion of the, the full stone wall, but they're kind of a, another iteration of that, the aesthetic of the estate walls, um, but most likely they're being chiseled or shaped to kind of create that specific shape um, or are really just a really thin piece of stone that is literally more, not functioning as a structural element that they're just um, that they're just serving that aesthetic look. Uh, but I don't I don't know that they're they're kind of continuing in this estate wall sort of feel. But I, I haven't come across a specific term um, for those types of walls. So uh, Lee, let me uh, read off some uh, gushing praise from our audience, and then we'll wrap up. Uh, Rosamond says, "Fascinating presentation. Thank you." Uh, Anne says, fascinating, thank you. Angel says, uh, so interesting. Oh, that might have been Angela, sorry. <laughs> uh, Madeline says, very interesting, informative presentation. Uh, BF says, uh, learned so much. Thank you for such a comprehensive and informative meeting. Um, Alex says, thank you, very interesting. Barbara, lots of interesting information. Thank you, it's been a pleasure. Uh, Yvette says, very informative, thank you. And I'll stop there, but there's a lot more. Uh, uh, Sandy says, fabulous. I always wondered about these walls I see. Uh, so quite a bit of praise in the chat, Lee. Lee, do you have any last words for us before we wrap up? No, I, I just wanna thank everyone for coming. And, and there's definitely, there's a few resources out there for anybody looking to kind of learn more. Um, Susan Alport's book, Sermons in Stone, is a wonderful kind of start to beginning to end of kind of a little more history. Um, and then Robert Thorson is probably a name that anybody who's looked into stone walls, he's got several books that um, really kind of get into that more technical geological side. And so I'll just throw those out as my last words of if you're looking for some resources, there's some great books out there. Um, to really to dig into some more um, stone wall history. But and thank you for having me. And I'm glad that so many people were able to join us this morning. 
Yeah, so thank you. Uh, thank you, Lee. Thank you, Historic New England. I want to thank the Friends of the Tewksbury Library uh, for being the primary sponsor for the event. And I especially want to thank the libraries in Andover, Ashland, Newburyport, and Wayland uh, for partnering with Tewksbury and uh, helping us uh, spread the word. So folks, look for an email from me tomorrow with a link to a feedback survey, a link to this recording, and information about some of the other upcoming historic New England programs that uh, Tewksbury will be hosting. So thank you all so much, and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their day. Thanks so much, Lee. Have a good day. Thank you.